It's Monday morning, and 55-year-old Bruce Blackwood does something unusual, at least for him. He calls in to the off-track betting parlor he manages and tells them he won't be coming in. It was a very brief call. The person that took the phone call said, Bruce said, I slipped and fell in the bathtub. I uh, have to go to the hospital. I can't make it into work. I was worried about him. They were very concerned, especially for the fact that he mentioned that he hit his head. Just didn't seem right at all. The next day, he again fails to show up for work. After not hearing from him for a couple of days, I was in a complete panic. He was just gone. A friend of his told me that she had not heard from Bruce and did I hear from Bruce within those two days. And I said, no, something may have happened to Bruce. No one had heard from him. So it was a missing persons case. And his brother went to police. Detectives learned Bruce was well off, at least on paper, with real estate holdings worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. I went to the building that he owned in Bushwick. I got a group together that consisted of family friends. And I made up a picture of my brother and wrote out, had anybody seen him? And we went into that area, passing out posters. Went into the stores, nailed them up on the trees, stopped people in the street. That's what we did. I don't feel that he had any kind of enemies that would cause him to disappear. All roads led us to believe that there was definitely something nefarious had been done to Mr. Blackwood. We do a morgue search, check for car accidents. Unfortunately, in this case, he had just disappeared off the face of the earth. Police obviously hit neighbors, tenants, particularly tenants, because if, if he's going to have any kind of conflict, it's going to be with tenants, people who don't pay the rent, people who complain and threaten lawsuits, people who might be conceivable enemies. I went to the Hancock Street address in Brooklyn to interview the tenants that live in the building and the handyman slash super. He lived in the apartment on the third floor. He invited us in. We went up to his apartment on the third floor. The handyman told detectives that he saw Mr. Blackwood on Tuesday, the following day, which would be March 7th. Bruce had arrived at the house at about 9.30, 10 o'clock in the morning. They discussed renovations that were being done, and Bruce had told them that he had to take a ride somewhere to run some errands. At some point, he heard a horn beeping outside, and Mr. Blackwood told him that his friend Michael, Mike, was outside. He then observed Mr. Blackwood leave the building and entered a black Toyota Camry and drove off with this individual. The handyman didn't know who Mike was, never saw him before, and that was the last time that he had seen Mr. Blackwood. I could not think of one person that Bruce ever mentioned to me with the name Mike. There were a couple of co-workers named Mike at work, but no one that Bruce was uh, friendly with on that level. Spoke to a neighbor who recalled the weekend right before Mr. Blackwood went missing that he observed Mr. Blackwood involved in a argument with two individuals standing in his driveway. Described both individuals as being male Hispanics. One of the males he recognized from doing work on Mr. Blackwood's house he believed that he was a uh, employee and the handyman for Mr. Blackwood. He stated that the altercation became heated. Both men appeared very agitated. He overheard Mr. Blackwood say something to the effect that it wasn't supposed to cost this much money. That's not what we agreed on. The argument was definitely over money. With money as the possible motive, detectives looked more closely at Bruce Blackwood's finances. I personally went to the American Airlines Credit Union, and that's when we realized Bruce had been to that credit union to report that he was missing 13 checks. A total of 13 personal checks that were fraudulently signed 
couple of forged checks. Twelve of those checks were written out to Luis Perez, and one check was written out to Martin Rodriguez. An individual, Luis Perez, basically hired to do work at Hancock Street. The total amount for all 13 forged checks was $7,700. Luis Perez was somehow involved. Detectives dig into Luis Perez's record. It was shocking. He spent 10 years in jail in Massachusetts for attempting to kill his daughter and the mother of the child. State troopers actually stopped him, and he stabbed one of the state troopers. Weeks after detectives ask for Bruce's phone records, they finally arrive. They go over his calls, including the one he made to OTB. Bruce had said he'd slipped in the bathtub and couldn't come to work. We were able to triangulate that call, and he was hitting off a cell phone tower approximately two blocks away from the Hancock Street location. We believed that he was actually inside and that he was with Luis Perez. Detectives can't prove Bruce was murdered, but they do have proof someone had been stealing from him. We received copies of all the forged checks. Handwriting analysis was able to determine that Luis Perez did write those checks out. Luis Perez was arrested and was charged with multiple counts of grand larceny and forgery. He also secured a search warrant for Perez's Hancock Street residence, where we believe Mr. Blackwood was murdered. Our crime scene unit ripped up carpeting. They removed drain pipes, traps in the sinks, and the shower and bathtub. Unfortunately, there was nothing there that they found that could help in our investigation. Luis Perez pleads guilty to passing fraudulent checks. But all this proves is that these guys were stealing from Blackwood, and this still is a missing persons case. The case of his disappearance goes as cold as the deep waters of the East River. So, I said to myself, I'm not going to let my brother die like this. I'm not going to, this is a hell of a way for him to go out. He didn't deserve this. Perez was the key point in my brother's death. I felt that very strongly. But Luis Perez was like a ghost. I turned my attention to trying to find him. But this guy moved around a lot. Eventually, I got him by phone and he basically denied everything. Weeks into the investigation, the detective gets contacted by an unexpected source. It was Luis Perez's daughter. She proceeded to tell me what she knew about this case. She says, he's going to do something like that again. She was so afraid of him, but she was afraid for the well-being of her daughter that she decided to come forward. I asked her would she be willing to record him talking about it. We had a mini recorder that we gave her. She can seclude it in any place she wanted. And in that conversation, Luis Perez, in detail, told her how he had killed Bruce Blackwood in that apartment. We knew Luis Perez killed Bruce Blackwood. We knew that he had gotten rid of his body and that he had done a good job in getting rid of it. There was no forensic evidence whatsoever, meaning not even a blood trail, no body, not even a piece of a body. Still, I secured an indictment, and Detective Strafford went out and arrested Lewis Perez. By the start of the murder trial, police locate some key witnesses, including Perez's former helper, Martin Rodriguez, this little squirrely, mousy type of guy who couldn't hurt a fly. He was scared to death that Perez was out to get him. It was very clear that Martin Rodriguez had nothing to do with the murder of Bruce Blackwood. 14 days into the trial, Rez's daughter takes the stand to reveal what her father told her. 
She testified to what her dad had told her in gruesome, terrible details, everything that he did to Bruce Blackwood. But the jury needed to hear the recording in his own voice. He said that Bruce had found out he had been stealing checks from him, and Perez said, and he told him, you know, the police is going to come to get me, to arrest me. So you're not He goes, I tied him to a chair. You know, I said, let me put him on the joke, let me put him to sleep like this. You know, I just, I just joke with you hard, and I said, it's man. He then said that he knew he had to get rid of him. The plastic that I put down is a construction plastic. The real, real, real thick plastic. And then he went to work, his words. He went to work on his body. He used a saw. He used a machete. Yeah, the saw saw and the machete. I had to. Because when I tried to use the saw on the skin, it was just ripping the skin and making a lot of mess. Something the machete doing, all I did was slice it like a chicken. When I used the saw He used bleach to clean out the drains. I cleaned it. that whole room, bleached the water and everything. I used garbage bags to the bottom unit. Everything went in the garbage, and the garbage dumped He paid several homeless people. They didn't know what they were doing, and they just deposited the bags that had Mr. Blackwood's remains in different locations so that they would be picked up by sanitation. The jury deliberated for less than three hours, and they found him guilty of murder in the second degree. I didn't have a body to bury. My brother was chopped up, and for him to be stuffed in bags like he was a piece of garbage, to be destroyed like that. You know, I mean, that hurt really, really tremendously. Luis Perez was sentenced to 25 to life, and that was the maximum sentence that was allowable under the law. So there is some justice there. Is there justice for Bruce Blackwood? No. The way he was tragically taken, the, the way his remains were desecrated, there's no justice in that. <laughs>